Very nice, very nice. We continue this week with the story of Vincent Van Gogh. The last two years of his life turn out to be very, very difficult. And this is his final self-portrait. He lives for a year in a mental health asylum. He paints a lot while he's there, and he continues painting when he gets out. He produces a painting almost every single day of the last year of his life. He paints many masterpieces that will one day sell for tens of millions of dollars, but only one painting sold during his lifetime, the Red Vineyard. Five months after it sold, Vincent was exhausted by his feverish pace, struggling with his mental health, and considering himself a failure. And Vincent takes his own life. He was 37 years old. Vincent's painting for today is this one, titled Shoes. Throughout his work, Vincent reveled in finding beauty and presence in ordinary places and things. He wrote, poetry surrounds us everywhere, but putting it on paper is, alas, not so easy as looking at it. Shoes were by no means a common subject for painters in Vincent's day. He bought this pair at a flea market, and then after walking in them through the Parisian mud for some time, he decided to paint them, mud, scuffs, and all. Vincent said that it was only after he'd walked through lots of mud that he found these shoes worthy of painting. What about you? Do you see beauty in ordinary things? Do you find these shoes to be a worthy subject to paint? And if so, what about them makes them worthy? And how would the painting feel different if the shoes were brand new? Let's just pause for a moment to take it in and let this painting speak to us. Back in the day, maybe early middle school in my life, I remember conversations with girls who I knew from the evangelical church I attended. We would talk about Jesus. We would talk about how much we loved Jesus. These were the kind of conversations that would take place at slumber parties and late at night in our cabins at summer church camp. We were starting to be interested in boys. Well, they were interested <laughs> in boys. I was more interested in girls, but I kept that to myself at the time. And in these conversations, some girls would say, oh, so earnestly, y'all, I wish I could date Jesus. Wouldn't Jesus be the best boyfriend? No doubt, those conversations were inspired by images of Jesus that looked something like this. (laughs) 
Now, if this was not the Jesus we knew from the Sunday school wall, no, no, no. The Jesus of my teen years, well, he might be blonde or brunette, but he was always handsome. Jesus was hot. Jesus was dreamy. (laughs) These kinds of images of Jesus were and are also ridiculously culturally outrageous. If I had once seen an image of Jesus like this, I might have had just a little bit less internalized racism to overcome. That's a sermon for another day. Of course, I have long since come to see the images of a white, dreamy Jesus to be preposterous and offensive. Why am I showing them now? Well, I always ask you to reflect on your emotions or associations as we read from the Bible. I'm doing the same. The Jesus my friends and I envisioned in our youth looked like a sexy boyfriend Jesus that any girl would want to date. I've come a long way, y'all, in so many respects. I'm sure you have too. Our scripture today is from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Apparently, Jesus liked to kick back and chill sometimes. In this case, he's with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He seems to just be resting, relaxing, and reflecting in the home of the three siblings who were among his dearest friends. Note that only one of them, Lazarus, the male sibling, is sitting at the table. Martha serves them. At some point, maybe after dinner, Mary enters the room. Verse 3. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Nard, by the way, comes from a plant called spike nard. I know because I looked it up. It has been used for centuries and is still used today for religious, beauty, and medicinal purposes. In ancient times, it was used to prepare a body for burial. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. This is a scene that comes from John's imagination. Here, John explicitly lends his editorial comments on what Judas says and why he might have said it. Remember, John's gospel is the last gospel written 60, 70, 80 years or so after Jesus had been crucified. It's not a newspaper account. John fills in this motivation for Judas, given how Judas' story and betrayal of Jesus developed over those decades as the story was told and retold. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. So we have Jesus, a guest of honor, at a dinner at the home of his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The story opens with Lazarus at the table with Jesus, and Martha is serving them. Knowing something of the cultural context helps us understand why what happens next is truly a cringe-worthy moment. Mary's action is about to make everyone very uncomfortable. First off, 
Mary enters this male-only space where the disciples are relaxing after dinner with Jesus. According to gender norms at the time, she and her sister Martha, you remember Martha in Luke's version, Martha is the one who's always doing the housework, right? That's what Mary and Martha should be doing in this story, at least according to custom. They should be scrubbing the dishes in some unseen part of the house. But in this space where the men are relaxing and talking, women should enter only to serve. But that's not what Mary does. Mary boldly breaks that barrier. She walks right into the middle of a space that she is not supposed to occupy. And then she touches Jesus, a man to whom she is not related, in a culture where a woman touching a man is total taboo. And not only does she touch him, but she touches him in a very intimate way. You know when you're in a room with other people and someone does or says something outrageous and you can just feel the anxiety level in the room rise and everybody looks at each other like, what is happening right now? Sort of like how it might have been at the Academy Awards last week when Will Smith strode up on the stage and slapped Chris Rock. I mean, watching at home, as I was, maybe you were too, it was hard to follow what was happening, <laughs> but it was later reported that the people in the room were aghast. So Mary approaches Jesus, but not to slap him, oh no. She touches his feet. She anoints his feet with perfume. It's this very sensuous and intimate act. As I've noted in sermons before, feet in Hebrew is a euphemism for another much more private body part. For example, in the Hebrew scriptures, in the book of Ruth, when Naomi tells Ruth to go to, Bo to, go to Boaz at night while he is sleeping and to uncover Boaz's feet, she is telling her to have sex with him. In this story, in John's story, Mary is touching Jesus' literal feet, but there is a symbolic intimacy built into the story. John includes an aspect of intimacy in the way he tells the story of the relationship between Mary and Jesus. The sensuous touch between unmarried people, presumably, a woman and a man, would not have escaped anyone's attention. And to top it all off, Mary uses perfume that cost more money than any of the disciples had probably handled in their lifetime. One denarius is about a day's work for a day laborer. 300 would be almost a year's wages. That's a lot of money to spend. I mean, the disciples loved Jesus too, they also saw Jesus as their beloved teacher. But no matter how much you appreciate your teacher, you don't usually buy break-the-bank perfume and then slather them with it in public. No, most people get a Starbucks gift card. <laughs> to quote Episcopal priest Chana Tetzlaff, the question that has occupied the imaginations of theologians throughout the centuries must have been on everyone's mind in that moment. Is there something more than meets the eye going on between Mary and Jesus? Chana Tetzloff's answer, of course there was something going on between them. Mary has fallen in love with the Christ, with God, the gracious lover of souls, reveling in the joy that comes from her very soul being laid bare before her maker and finding, instead of judgment, love and desire for her soul, for her true self, for her. Though Chana Tetzloff's response here does not necessarily denote romantic intimacy, theologians and, well, just normal people have long speculated 
did Jesus have a wife? Some say, ah, of course he didn't. The Bible doesn't say anything about a wife. It wouldn't have been silent on such an important issue. The truth is, the Bible is silent on some important issues. And the Bible disproportionately tells the stories of men, and it relatively rarely mentions their spouses. It might have been more noteworthy for a 30-year-old male Jew not to have been married. There's no reliable historical evidence to support the claim that Jesus was married or unmarried, for that matter. The assumption that Jesus was unmarried is pretty firmly entrenched in the Christian tradition. It is foundational, for example, to Roman Catholic tradition that only males are ordained and that then they are to be celibate. But since this is not a sermon about whether or not Jesus was married, (laughs) for now, we'll just leave it at this. Why not? What difference would it make? And if you're someone who resists the idea, what might that tell you about yourself or about your attitudes or assumptions about sex or marriage or celibacy? Back to our text. In this story from John, we get the sense that Mary's actions are somehow shameful or scandalous, maybe something only a brazen harlot would do. But what if Mary got it right? Remember last week, the definition of prodigal is wastefully extravagant? What if Mary's excessive outpouring of love is the appropriate response to Jesus? And what if the shocked standoffishness of the disciples shows their lack of devotion? What if what's scandalous here isn't her tender intimacy with Jesus, but rather their reluctance to engage with their beloved teacher in a personal, vulnerable way? Of course, Judas then steps in with a question for which we tend to demonize him. John certainly does. But it's actually a very good question that modern people still struggle with. John asks, is this a waste of money? This hunk of money could do so much to meet the needs of real people who right now are hungry, displaced, hurting. What is the most faithful way to spend the limited resources we have? What church doesn't struggle with that question? And if they don't, they should. At First Congo, for example, we prayerfully and very carefully considered whether to invest in remodeling, updating our sanctuary, our lobby area. And along the way, we've asked ourselves if we should spend money on updating tech equipment to make the live stream top-notch, or should we resurface the parking lot? I feel very good about where we have come out on all of those decisions. My point is that those are good questions, questions we should engage in again and again and again. Is this the best way that we as a church who seeks to be faithful should spend the limited funds that we have? Jesus replies to Judas, leave Mary alone. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Truer words were never spoken, for we no longer have Jesus with us, not in any bodily, literal way. What we do have is plenty of people to love and to serve in all kinds of ways, globally and locally. We love God by caring for creation. We love God by doing our very best to sustain 
this church, this life-saving body of Christ. We need to be here because people who are hurting need us. Loving God means to love everything and everyone that God loves. For Vincent, looking at something deeply was a kind of love. He wrote, I always think that the best way to know God is to love many things. Love a friend, a wife, something, whatever you like. You will be on the way to knowing more about God. That is what I say to myself. But one must love with a lofty and serious, intimate sympathy, with strength, with intelligence, And one must always try to know deeper, better, and more. That leads to God. Following Vincent's lead, we love by being willing to look at something or someone just exactly as they are and loving them, not requiring perfection, but appreciating authenticity. We love God by looking deeply at the sacredness of all that is. We love God by loving all that is. Amen.